Surprise. Expect the unexpected. Probably one of the worst memories uh, that most kids have is that uh, intrepid phrase, just wait until your father gets home. Any of you ever heard that from? Yeah. Seems like after you hear that, time just slows down. It's like molasses at that point. The seconds tick by, and with every second, it seems like it gets louder. Seconds seem like minutes. Minutes seem like hours. Hours seem like days. And then, and then, the height of it all, the jingling of the keys and the turning of the deadbolt before the imposing figure of your father shows up, who has told you time and time again, I brought you into this world, I can take you out. And so there he is standing there, and the anxiety that fills the day finally comes to a head. Now, it's probably not as traumatic as I remember, and it didn't happen all that often because, of course, I mean, look at me, I'm a great kid. <laughs> but the fact is that uh, there, there is anxiety that builds up when you're anticipating something. And as I was reading over the verses this week and thinking through what happens between um, the Old Testament and the New Testament, I, I thought of Malachi 4, 5, and 6, where the uh, Old Testament ends. Behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of uh, fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. The end. Now, if you know uh, something about the Bible, you know that there are two uh, testaments, and that in between those two testaments, there was 400 years of silence. God's people did not hear directly from him. They did not hear from prophets. They did not hear uh, from people who claimed to speak for God. They didn't hear from God himself. Imagine that. You're sitting there. The, the last thing that you hear from God is, um, unless I decide to, uh, uh, unless I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. And you've been his people all of these centuries. You've seen his hands move you out of the land of Egypt. You've uh, seen him move you into the promised land. And now, all of a sudden, you have to be wondering, where is God? Why is he silent? What is he up to? And there's questions that people have to be asking, like, what is this great and dreadful day that Malachi is talking about? Or what if God has changed his mind and his sovereignty decided, I'm going to destroy this land with a, with a decree of utter destruction? But just because God is silent doesn't mean that God isn't working. You see, between the Testaments, a lot actually happened. The Persian Empire was uh, in charge at this point. Malachi was writing, and then suddenly we see the rise of Alexander the Great. He causes the regions that he, uh, that he possesses to speak Greek. And so the Old Testament, the old Hebrew text, gets translated into Greek, the Septuagint, or 70 as it's known. And then around 167 B.C., Antiochus Epiphanes shows up. And the Seleucid government takes over, and they become the rulers over Israel, and Epiphanes has an idea. I'm going to overthrow the temple of God. Sounds like a good idea. In fact, I'm going to make it so bad that I'm going to slaughter a pig on the altar of God just to get at the juice. Not only that, I'm going to erect worship to pagan gods inside of their temple of God. And then we see the Hasmoneans and the uh, Maccabees come, and they come out and overtake the rulers that are in the temple. They overthrow the, um, the religious leaders that um, Epiphanes has put into place, and they restore worship in the temple, Jewish worship in the temple which is where Hanukkah comes from. And then in 63 BC, a man named Pompey shows up. Pompey becomes the, is the leader of Rome, and he conquers Israel. And we get this setting where Rome is in charge at the time of the birth of Jesus. And all of these events lead up to what Paul calls the fullness of time, where his son was to be born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law. 
Now, God was working out his plan all along, not just through Israel. He didn't need to use Israel to fulfill his plan, to speak to them in order to fulfill his plan. He's in charge of the whole world, and he causes the entire world to lead up to this moment of the birth of his son. It was by God's hand that there were 200 years of peace that were in place between the nationalities when Jesus shows up. It was by God's hand that the world had a common language. And it was by God's hand that a government ruled by egomaniacs who said, let's have a census. Count all the people we have. Let's tax them. Because the government needs their taxes. Because, well, who knows why they needed taxes. I mean, some of these men even called themselves deities. And that would bring us to Mary and Joseph. Because far before that, hundreds of years before that, it was prophesied that in Bethlehem a great Savior would arise. And in order for that Savior to be born in Bethlehem, Caesar had to decree a census. And he decrees the census, and Joseph and Mary traveled to Bethlehem, and guess what happens? Jesus is born, the king of Israel. And that's where we're going to pick up today in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. I hope you have your Bible with you. If you do, I encourage you to turn there. In the first service, I turned to Mark 2, and that is not where we are. But if you come out on Wednesday nights, we're still doing a study called Who is Jesus? I encourage you to check that out. It's on our Facebook page as well. So here we are, Luke 2, verses 8 through 20. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds said. But Mary treasured all of these things up, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you that your word contains... The reality of your pouring out of love unto us. That for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And God, as we look through this scripture, I pray that whatever distractions are there, whatever the devil may be up to, to just try and destroy uh, us from hearing the message, that you will cease that, that you will fight on our behalf. That we will see that this child has come to bring joy. He is a savior and he is the conqueror. And God, may we glorify and praise your name from what we hear, what we come to see about this baby. And I pray that in Christ's name. Amen. After Camden was born, I thought I had, well, even leading up to the time Camden was born, I thought I had it licked. Like, I thought I, was, I, thought I knew how to be a parent. Then I learned to expect the unexpected. I made it about a day before that changed my mind. But in my haste and arrogance, I thought, well, let's, let's have another kid. So 16 months later, I have Simon. Now we have two boys running around. Two boys who half the time won't keep their clothes on, who are screaming and fighting, who are making me hide in a corner and cry, Kristen barricading herself in the room, and we're just hoping to make it through the day. Now, about that time, of course, we would get unexpected visitors. And I'd be like, we're actually better parents than this. But um, we're terrified. Expect the unexpected. But the truth is, I earned my gray hair. So some of you might say, hey, you're prematurely gray. And I say, well, that's right, but you haven't met my boys. You don't live with them. Then, then you earn your gray hair. Now, a few of us wake up during the day or in the morning and think, you know, today seems like something unexpected is going to happen. Like, this is going to be...
day. This is going to blow my day away. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. And now I imagine that that's probably what the shepherds thought. So they're staring out at the stars. Some of them are sleeping as one of the other shepherds takes their turn, keeping their watch over the flock by night. They're doing whatever you think about and do it as a shepherd at midnight, and whatever you're pondering, and then bam, that angel of the Lord appears, and the glory of the Lord shows around you, and you're startled, right? Is that what happens? You're startled? No. They were filled with great fear. The glory of God shows around them, and an angel of God appears before them. And notice what the text says is their reaction. They were filled with great fear. Now, get this. They weren't just frightened. It wasn't just like, oh, oh, it's just God. No big deal. Just an angel. Whew. I thought it was somebody scary. No, they were terrified. They were terrified by the presence of God's glory and by the presence of this angel. Now listen, for 400 years, the message of, uh, messages from God had ceased. They hadn't heard anything. And then the first recorded thing that we see from heaven is some angels appearing to shepherds. You see, the heavens split open and God's glory falls upon them. And I would think that they're probably thinking in their minds the word of Isaiah that says, I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips. I live among unclean people and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord, is right before God. No one can stand in the presence of God. They recognize their complete unworthiness for what is around them. And they're terrified, and they're on their faces, and they're thinking, this is it, this is it, I'm going to die. God's, God's going to smite me, because that's what they believed back then. You see the face of God, of course, if you saw the face of God, you would die. But if God appears to you, you're dead, your time is up. And so the shepherds are terrified, and they're thinking, goodness gracious, what is going to happen here? But they have these unexpected visitors, and the unexpected visitors say this, fear not. Now, it's a command. It's not just, hey, chill out, dude. Fear not. I'm not here to destroy you. I'm not here to bring judgment. I'm not here to curse you. I'm here to bring you a message. Fear not. And with that unexpected command, we see that the message is about to be delivered. It's a great message that will radically change not just the lives of the shepherds, but the lives of all who hear it all through the centuries. And that's what the reality of Jesus' birth is all about, isn't it? To really take in the fullness and the, un, uh, and the, uh, the fullness of what is unfolding in these passages is to recognize that God is not the God of fear. God is God and we can rest in Him. His presence drives away all fear. Fear not, Christian, for God is with you. And the Angels bring this message from heaven itself saying, fear not, shepherds, for I bring you good news with great joy, which will be to unpeople. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. God is with you. He brings an unexpected proclamation of good news, great joy that will be for all the people and launches into the context of what that message says. And it's with great anticipation of what this proclamation will cause that the, that the angels continue on saying, I bring you good news of great joy which will be all on people unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. I want you to notice the unexpected audience with an unexpected proclamation. Notice what the text says. It says, for unto you is born this day. Unto them. Now, who are we talking about here? We're talking about shepherds. Shepherds are like the lowliest of low. Between criminals and shepherds, there are far greater amounts, uh, better people to pronounce the arrival of the Son of God. And yet God chooses to reveal this great treasure, this great message to shepherds. Now, shepherds, they're unskilled. They're, they're, they're looked down upon. They're uneducated. They stayed away from society because their job was basically 24-7, which meant that they also couldn't go to the temple. They couldn't keep the man-made uh, rules that the, uh, that the uh, religious elite had put into place. 
That means also that people looked at them with suspicion because they assumed that they knew their motives, and so they thought, well, since they're always out there, they must be dangerous. And so it was assumed that shepherds were um, uh, robbers, that they were murderers, that they stole people's flocks, all of these kinds of things. And yet, and yet, what society sees as lowly and unworthy, God says, you are worthy enough to, although you are unworthy, you are going to hear this message of my son's arrival because, because it's not about you. It's about my love. It's about my love. I mean, kings and religious leaders and righteous people, anybody, anybody but shepherds. And you have to think that for 400 years we don't hear anything and then the angels appear to some unworthy shepherds? That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't jive. But there's a really a whole lot to be said about this unexpected audience, isn't there? Because if we're honest with ourselves, we're all the shepherds. Amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. We carry around our sorrows and our hurts and our pains and our anxieties and our fears and our anguish. We carry around and hide our sins from the past, hoping that no one will find out. Because if they did find out, people would look down on us. They would see who we really are. I told uh, the uh, people who were here on Wednesday night that, you know, 2020, this physical mask is really just a representation of what we do as a society every single day. We wear a mask, hoping that nobody sees really who we are because we've deemed ourselves unworthy, unlovable, unredeemable, unsavable. And yet God says, that's not the case at all. That's not the case at all. Now, there are shameful parts of us that we hope nobody ever finds out, but God says, you bring those to the cross. You bring them to the manger. I will, I will redeem those things. We try to suppress our sexual desires. We may uh, fall into pornography and feel the guilt every time that we fail in not viewing pornography. We may feel the great weight of addiction and be looking at an empty bottle or an empty syringe once again and saying, I will never conquer this. I cannot break this. That I'm going to languish here forever because no one cares. Not even God cares. And we hide in dark homes where we feel the loneliness, deep-seated loneliness. Then we think, God doesn't even care about me. No one will ever care about me. But that is not at all what the text tells us. It says, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, for unto you is born this day. This message from God is as much for us as it was for the shepherds that night who first hold it. And the reality of the proclamation that this angel made will never, ever cease. The, angel, the shepherds fall on their feet before God, before his glory, and they recognize something. This is not a message about the future. This is a message about something that has happened already. Something that has already happened. Hope had already arrived, and it had arrived for them. It had arrived for everyone. And you might be able to say, well, great, that's great. And this angel says there's good news, a great joy, but the reality is you don't know me. And you're right, I don't know many of you. I don't know what you struggle with. I don't know what you carry around in your sin and your heart. I don't know what you carry around in shame and fear and anguish. I don't know what you struggle with, whether it's anger or depression or addiction or sorrows. I don't know. But I know the one who does. And he has the answers that you're looking for. I mean, look at the context of the rest of verse 11 here. It says, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, listen, many people have claimed to be the Savior. Heck, even Caesar said that he was the Savior. Caesar Augustus, the, uh, the Senate made him a deity after his death. And as he's dying, he says, I've taken Rome from clay to marble, from paved marble. marble. Have I done a good job? And people said, yes. 
he's a god because he ushered in 200 years of peace called the Pax Romana. And yet he doesn't have a claim to what Jesus Christ has, which is eternal power to give eternal peace. 200 years will pale in comparison to what awaits us in heaven. So anybody can say they're a savior, but no one calls themselves the savior of the world and then backs it up with undeniable proof like Jesus has. <laughs> the word literally means rescuer. And he's here for you. This baby wasn't just some fly-by-night magician. Just here today, gone tomorrow. Some swindler. No, this baby, this baby stayed with us. He grew into a man. And not just any man, he grew into a man who was strong enough to withstand temptations from Satan himself and never sinned. He would grow up to be a man who would take on the fullness of God's wrath, a punishment too great for anyone to bear. And he came out victorious on the other side. He was a man who took on our sorrows and our disease and our, uh, and our infirmities and our sin and in all of that, he died rejected by everyone. I mean, imagine that. The Son of God comes into the world. And I can't imagine the loneliness he must have felt. Because he's the only one who's on mission for God 100% of the time. Now, the crowds are all around him. I mean, heck, it's like a, a pastor's dream, right? 5,000 men, just men, not counting women and children, on a hill that want to stay through their meal. To listen to you preach. All right, that's like every pastor's dream. And yet I imagine that Jesus is sitting there and he's teaching and he's pontificating all of these things. The Beatitudes. And the crowds leave. Never once do we see in the Bible where crowds respond in mass to his message. Sure, we see one, two, three people. We see a woman with a bleeding disorder for 12 years. It's my favorite, my favorite episode of Jesus' ministry. And she's, she's bleeding, right? And she's like probably the worst person in the world. Nobody loves this. Nobody wants to be around this woman. Not only does she bleed, she's unclean, so she can't go into the temple. She's destitute because at the hands of all these doctors, she's been hurt, she's grown worse. And she sees this Jesus, the one born in a manger, and all these crowds around him. She thinks, if I could just touch, maybe even just the hem of his garment, I could be made well. And as her hand is trembling and she's reaching out, she touches it. She touches it, right? And she's healed immediately. And Jesus turns around and says, who touched me? And the disciples are like, what are you, an idiot? There's thousands of people here. What do you mean, who touched you? That woman touched Jesus in a way that nobody else had in saving faith. In a faith that was required. And he turns around and he sees this woman who falls and she explains everything to him. He says, daughter, not, you sicko, get away from me, Daughter. You have been made well. Go in peace. You see, Jesus sent his son into the world not, <laughs> not to be big and strong and mighty, but to be the humblest of humble. The humblest of humble. And yet, even though all of the crowds left him, his friends at the end abandoned him, you remember Peter says, Lord, where, were you, where should we go? You have the words of eternal life. And then he sees Jesus headed for the cross. He's like, well, maybe not. He just walks away. Jesus is there by himself on a cross, dying for those who have despised and rejected and hated, who say, I can't even look at you. You're pathetic. It's disgusting. And then in the midst of that, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So go ahead and tell me. That this baby born in a manger isn't strong enough to overcome whatever plagues you. 
Go ahead and tell me that he isn't with, able to withstand the strongest storms that come against you. That he isn't able to pull, pull you through and stand on your behalf. Tell me that this baby isn't strong enough to stand in the midst of temptation that you're facing and say, get away from me, you devourer. This is my child. So the next time that you're staring at a bottle that may be full and you're thinking, I don't want to drink that again. I don't want to put that syringe in there, but I don't know what else to do because my mind is telling me, I have to do this. Or the next time that you're thinking, I know that I shouldn't uh, have, uh, have an affair with this, this person, but I'm just so drawn to her. Know that God is fighting on your behalf. That the power of Christ lives in you. And the power of Christ isn't just fantasy. It's reality. We're on the third day. This same Jesus who was nailed to a cross and killed rose from the dead in great victory. You have victory, Christian, in Jesus Christ. That's the good news and great joy that God himself has taken on flesh. That he is here. Listen, the greatest hope for all of humanity, the greatest joy for all of humanity, the greatest good news for all of humanity is that God has come. He is all that you need and so much more. His arrival is good news and no circumstance, no person, nothing can or will ever change that. And now imagine that the shepherds are hearing all of this for the first time, recovering from the flashbang that they just uh, experienced as the glory of God shone around them. And And they're pondering all of these things, and they're thinking, God has come to earth. What does that mean for us? He's come to earth to me, who's unworthy, completely, completely unholy before God. And they're standing there, and then they hear this. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. What? Lying in a manger? Sure, swaddling clothes, that makes sense. Every newborn would be wrapped in swaddling clothes. The mother's good. But lying in a manger? I mean, did you hear that? Lying in a manger. Now, we're not talking like a nice crib. We're talking an animal feeding trough. An animal feeding trough. He's lying there in an animal feeding trough in a stinking cave filled with animals, born to two nobodies. And the first people to find out about his birth are some stinky shepherds. God himself in a feeding trough. And as they're pondering all of these things, the skies open up. They can no longer contain the praise and the joy and the adoration and the worship that is going on before the throne of God. And the heavens burst open with a multitude of the heavenly host. And they say, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. Heaven is busting at the seams, and the angels have longed to look at the salvation of man, the love of God. They long to experience that, that God himself loves sinful people so much that he would give his son to die for them. That is unfathomable to them, and they break out in praise. The movement of God on the behalf of us elicits praise before his throne. And it should elicit the same response in us. Glory to God in the highest, for he has brought us peace. And you'll notice that the text says that as soon as the angels left them, as soon as the angels left them, they said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem And see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And when they went with haste, they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds said. But Mary treasured these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, buying and praising God for all they had seen and heard, as it had been told to them. When they get to the manger, they are met with unexpected humility. For centuries, the Holy of Holies in the temple was separated by a thick curtain. A curtain that only one person could enter through 
one time of year into the glory of God. And only after a very long process of uh, purification. And then, the first people to see God, God's child, face to face, are ones who are wholly unclean and unworthy. Laying in a feeding trough. The God of very gods. See, he's an infant who had the right to claim everything as his own. He was an infant who had come into the world with great, he could have come into the world with great fanfare and great splendor and great triumph and great power. He could have ceased everything if he chose. An infant whose praises in heaven would have, uh, would have been going on throughout eternity and would have eclipsed the praise that the angels were just giving God before the shepherds. And yet, these shepherds are standing here face to face with God in human flesh, their greatest hope in the lowliest of settings having laid down the trappings of what it meant to be God and say, because I love humanity so much, because I love my Father so much, He says, this is the only way. I will go to the cross for them even when they despise and reject me and turn me away. You see, Jesus' story starts in a stable, in a feeding trough, in great humbleness, and then it, his death ends in the greatest humiliation possible. God incarnate, beaten, stripped naked, spit on, mocked, ridiculed, rejected, despised, hated, hanging on a cross before the entire world to see in complete humiliation. And the, it says that the people who heard this wondered about what, what were they wondering? Like, they were wondering at the message. This is who the angels said that, the, that this child is? Are you sure, shepherds? Because shepherds, well, their testimonies wouldn't even be accepted in court. But what they're hearing is so magnificent, so wonderful, they have to ponder the message and they wonder, is it even possible that these shepherds who are completely unworthy and outcasts of society would be allowed to access the presence of God incarnate, also causing them to say, who is this child? But notice what it says about Mary. Mary treasured all of these things and pondered them in her heart. She remembered them. She glorified God for what he was doing. From her womb, a wellspring of life had come, even to the most undeserving. And after seeing the baby, the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard. The shepherds received unexpected visitors. They were an unexpected audience. They were met with unexpected humility, and their reaction is to praise God for what he's done on behalf of them, and ultimately what he will do on behalf of the entire world. I said it earlier, the reality is we're all like the shepherds, whether we're rich or poor, whether we're beautiful or less beautiful, whether we're drug addicts or clean or adulterers, faithful to our spouses, depressed, joyful, kind, angry. We all are unworthy. The Bible says there is no one worthy. And yet, the picture we see at Christmas is that although we are unworthy, Christ's humility, Jesus' humility, invites every single one of us to bow at that manger. And the reality is that it was not just that we see that this happened and then that's it. I mean, we're talking about the reality that Jesus is born now and then dies for us, goes out through all eternity. We celebrate all of it. All of it. Now listen, it may or may not have been a silent night. I would probably think if you're having a baby, it's probably not a silent night. You had some unexpected visitors, not a silent night. But the reality is that the message is what counts. Fear not, 
For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. A Savior who is Christ the Lord, who is here to help the struggling, the hurting, the suffering, the lonely. Listen, this time of year, around Thanksgiving and Christmas, are the highest suicide rates. It is. But Jesus came to bring hope and joy and great news that will change the whole world and your life. When you get to know him, there is no fear. He's taken fear and he's destroyed it and replaced it with the peace of God who, while we were still sinners, died for us. And nothing can change that. So you may think of yourself as unworthy. You're right, we're all unworthy. But for a God who's full of grace and humility and love for people, you are not unredeemable, child. The manger shows us that God will stop at nothing to redeem you. And so the question is, what do we do with this child? Who is this Jesus? Can he do what he says he could do? Can he save us? Yes. But you have to decide for yourself, is that something I truly believe? Or is that just some nice story that makes up part of my Christmas? I sure hope that's not the case for you. I sure hope you've come to the place where you've recognized that Jesus Christ not only lived a sinless life, but died for your sins, no matter who you are. That you can celebrate knowing that the eternal God is watching and waiting for you to return home. Don't miss that. Don't miss that this Christmas season. Unexpected visitors, unexpected audience and proclamation, and unexpected humility. I'm just going to 